There we go. So yeah, so everyone, uh, we are recording this event, um, just so you know. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to be emceeing today. Um, so I'm just going to introduce Shin, who's going to be giving the talk today. So this is another talk in the PIB speaker series. Um, Shin is a PhD student in the Computational Cognitive Science and Probabilistic Computing Groups at, M at MIT. Their research sits at the intersection of AI and cognitive science, asking questions like, how can we specify and perform inference over rich yet structured generative models of human decision making in order to accurately infer human goals and values? Uh, to answer these questions, Shin's work includes the development of probabilistic programming and automated planning infrastructure so as to enable fast and flexible Bayesian inference over complex models of agents and their environments. Uh, so I'm very excited to be introducing Shen. Um, they're really great. They are my mentor. We've had very wonderful conversations about a number of topics. Um, so I think you could pretty much talk to Shen about anything in the AI alignment slash philosophy world, and they will have very interesting and productive things to say. Um, so instead of saying anything about the topic, I think I'm just gonna pass it over to you so you can introduce it yourself. Uh, if that's okay. So we're going to go about 45 minutes and then um, we're going to do Q&A. Um, so 45 minutes to an hour. So yeah. Cool. Amazing. Thanks so much, Zach, for that wonderful introduction. Um, uh, it's good to see all, all of you here. Um, and today I'll be presenting, you know, I'd hope to do something more potentially like philosophical, but didn't have time to prepare like a fairly ambitious talk about like non-consequentialism and AI alignment, which is what I sort of think about, but don't do as much PhD research about. Um, but this is something I've been doing sort of more my focus over the course of my PhD research program. And let me share my screen so you can take a look. Um, I think I'm gonna share sound as well, because there's gonna be a little bit of sound. Um, all right, can people see that okay? Right, so uh, presenting uh, some work I did uh, over the past, you know, a few years of my PhD on modeling the mistakes of boundary rational agents in the Bayesian theory of mind, but you might have seen the subtitle I decided to add uh, for the context of this talk, which is, or how can Bayesian cognitive science inform AI value alignment? Um, and if you're not familiar with Bayesian cognitive science, as I think a research field, it's sort of like one of, it's an approach to cognitive science that tries to formalize human cognition and reasoning in sort of, uh, you know, Bayesian optimal terms, or at least an approximation to Bayesian optimal terms. Um, and uh, one of the people I think most associated with that line of sort of modeling humans uh, is Josh Tenenbaum, who's one of my advisors as part of the Computational Cognitive Science Group at MIT. And so in the course of my PhD, even though technically I'm a computer science student, I've ended up doing uh, sort of a cognitive science studies in order to try to understand sort of human decision making and planning. Um, and so in the background, I guess, of, of, of this talk, I think some interesting questions that my people, people might be interested in uh, are questions like, you know, what scientific knowledge about human psychology can inform the development of AI that infers human goals and values? Um, how can methodological and experimental practices in cognitive science and psychology aid the empirically informed development of such systems? And what modeling tools and frameworks does Bayesian cognitive science in particular offer uh, for modeling humans, agents, or social systems? Um, so I won't, you know, be giving answers to these questions, but I think that would be helpful to have, have in the background. I, I know that in PIBS, I think, it's, you know, we have a lot of people who are particularly interested in Bayesian cognitive science, so I'm not sure if they were able to join us today. And I think, you know, hopefully this makes for some fruitful, like food for thought and fruitful discussion. Cool. So getting to, I think, the research itself, right? Um, so people routinely infer the goals of others by observing their actions over time. Uh, and as this well-known video shows, we can do this for a very young age, as young as 18 years old. Oh. As you're watching this video, notice what happened. Hmm. The adult proceeds oh. a very strange and suboptimal plan. Hmm. Indeed, you could say that the plan just failed. And yet the child is able to infer what the adult probably wanted. So? Um, and it's the recognition of this failure that, you know, seems to lead the child to offer assistance. Right? 
And so the question uh, then is watching this video you might ask is like what explains this rich and flexible capacity for mental inference, even at you know, for even for toddlers as young as 18 months old. Um, and how are we, you know, capable of inferring the goals of others, even when they fail to achieve those goals? Uh, and how perhaps, you know, uh, for this audience, could we build AI that does the same? Right. So, um, and if people are interested, this is like a really nice series of experiments by Warnikan and Talmacello from 2006, where they tried to measure the difference in altruism between uh, human uh, toddlers and, 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 and chimps. Uh, and they do find that, you know, human infants seem to like offer to help a lot more. But I think in the context of that demonstrating really rich sort of like intuitive psychology in the process. Right. Um, so, um, right, so in order to do so, one possibility that I think is kind of a consensus uh, among psychologists uh, uh, is that humans have some intuitive model of theory, but why and how others achieve or fail to achieve their goals, right? Otherwise, we would not be able to attribute goals to others as an explanation for their actions in a way that's fairly domain general. And, and now if that's the case, where right, here's a follow-up question, right, which is what assumptions are we making about the rationality of other agents? such that we can infer both their goals and often not optimal plans. Um, and in trying to find an answer uh, to this question, it's important for us to disambiguate between two closely related questions. And the first is a question about human planning, right? Uh, what kinds of boundary rational agents are we that we made those sorts of failures, right? That we just saw, for example, right? And there's a second question is about human theory of mind, right? What kinds of boundary rational agents do we take each other to be? Um, and answers to this, both these questions can inform each other. Uh, in particular, if we know how humans in fact plan, we have reason to believe that humans might develop similar intuitive theories about how others plan. Right? Vice versa, by introspection into our intuitive explanations for why and how others plan, we could perhaps construct hypotheses for scientific theories about human planning, right? which you know, differ from, may differ from intuitive ones. Um, so they're very tightly knit, right? In fact, they're so tightly knit that I think today's uh, presentation will in inevitably tackle both of these fascinating questions. Um, but it's important to remember that they are different questions with different answers. For example, uh, it's likely that our theory of mind is only a very rough approximation of the cognitive processes of others, right? In other words, we might be making boundedly rational assumptions, but how boundedly rational uh, other agents are. Um, so having clarified, I think, the, the question we're primarily trying to answer, which is a question about human theory of mind in the context of these experiments, um, let's look at how some prior work has attempted to answer this question in humans and machines. So in, in an influential paradigm called Bayesian theory of mind, Chris Baker, Rebecca Sachs, and Josh Tenenbaum posited that our inferences about the mental states of others can be characterized as Bayesian inverse planning, right? That is that we model uh, other agents as rational planners, that act efficiently to achieve their goals. And, um, in and then we compute the posture over an agent's goals given observations of their behavior in sort of like a approximately Bayesian way, right? And in experiments they ran in this 2009 paper that they found that this sort of model uh, of how humans make inferences about others' goals correlates highly uh, with actual human goals inferences when we average over a population of humans, right? So what I'm showing on the left uh, here, uh, left of the graph here uh, is people sort of average sort of probability judgments about whether a particular goal, particular object was likely to be the goal. And uh, on, the, on the x axis here is the models predictions, right, the models probabilities assigned to a particular goal. Um, and they achieve, you know, pretty high correlation there, right. Um, but this model, I think there, there uh, is this model able to account for an agent's failure to achieve their goals. Well, if you examine it a little more closely, um, it does make a weak assumption about how other agents might not be perfect, right? One that has come to be, I think, pretty common uh, in a lot of both this kind of Bayesian cognitive science kinds of models, but also in uh, reinforcement learning and inverse reinforcement learning, uh, right? Which is that it assumes that agents may choose actions noisily, selecting actions that tend to minimize expected future costs according to a Boltzmann or softmax distribution. And this Boltzmann policy or Boltzmann agent model has come to be the de facto standard, right, as I mentioned earlier. Um, however, I think we have reason to suspect that this assumption might, might not be enough. Right? For one, it seems implausible in large environments that you know, humans are calculating this expected future cost term, right, this Q value, Q of S of A of T. Um, 
are calculating this expected future cost for all possible states of the world and all possible actions in order to compute a Boltzmann sort of policy, right? Um, and for another, this only captures suboptimality at the level of our actions. But what about higher level cognitive processes, such as our plans or our goals? So to address these limitations, I, our hypothesis is that humans intuitively understand that others commit mistakes at multiple levels of decision making. Right? This includes mistaken actions, as discussed, but also misguided plans that might fail to achieve our goals, and even mistaken goals, that is confusion or conceptual errors at the level of goal formation itself. Uh, and if this hypothesis is true, uh, then by modeling these mistakes, uh, we can achieve more human-like inference about the goals of others. Um, and we can formalize this hypothesis by specifying a Bayesian model uh, of a boundary rational agent using a probabilistic program, right? And if people were not familiar with probabilistic programs as a modeling uh, sort of framework, is basically the idea is a program which makes random choices in the course of its control flow. And this actually is a way of like simulating the randomness in, a real, in the real world, basically. Okay. Um, so, so here's how the sort of program or model goes, right? Uh, we assume, you know, we put a prior on the agent's initial goals, but at every time step uh, that, it, uh, that the agent might act, it has some probability of confusing that goal with a semantically similar state, or perhaps recovering the original goal, right? Pretty simple mistake model there. Then I think the most interesting part comes, which is that the agent plans ahead to achieve that goal, but in a boundedly rational manner. In particular, the agent doesn't form a complete plan from the start but instead only plans some steps ahead, executes those steps, and then replans as necessary. Replanning in this way is less cognitively demanding, uh, but can also lead to suboptimal or mistaken plans. Um, and then finally, the agent executes its plan. However, due to execution error or motor noise, the agent may sometimes execute a random action instead, that is a mistaken action. And these actions then cause changes to the environment state, uh, and an external observer receives potentially not noisy observations of that state. So given this overview of the model, let's dissect it a little further and its components uh, in more detail. First, so mistaken goals. While this might sound like an odd concept, uh, consider that semantically complex goals, perhaps baking a cake to a particular specification or spelling a word, uh, might lead to confusion or memory errors. For example, is it fiery or fiery? Um, we model these errors by assuming that the goal pursued at each time step has some probability of being corrupted from the intended goal or being corrected from the erroneous goal. Right? And we do this in a sort of domain specific way uh, in the context of this paper. Uh, so typos are one example if you're like trying to you know, spell words perhaps. Um, right, so that's one example. Uh, that's one kind of mistake you might have uh, when trying to plan to achieve some goals. Uh, next, mistake in plans. So imagine playing this game of Sokoban, right? Uh, where you have to push all of the crates so that you end up on the red dots. That's how you win the game. One approach would be to make a complete plan entirely in advance. But given the difficulty of this problem, this would be extremely cognitively demanding. Right? Instead, when faced with problems like these, it seems like we often form partial plans, which extend just a few steps ahead, and then interleave execution of those plans with additional plan. This reduces computational cost, but can lead to mistakes due to failure to plan ahead sufficiently. For example, in Sokoban, you might find yourself pushing a crate into a wrong corner and no longer being able to retrieve it. If anyone's played this, something like this game, you might have found, found yourself in a similar situation. Um, so how do we model this, right? Uh, we can use this probabilistic subroutine shown on the left, right? And at every time step, we only continue planning if the existing partial plan does not extend to the current time step or does not say what to do in the current state. Otherwise, we simply return a previous plan. So if we've planned to this time set, we just execute whatever we already have. We don't need to plan further. Right. Um, if we do continue planning, uh, we invoke a partial planning algorithm uh, with three major components. Right? The first is the search budget, which specifies how much computa computational resources to devote to additional planning. Uh, the second is the planning algorithm itself, uh, which specifies a high level strategy for computing a plan. The third is the planning heuristic, um, I meant to click these, sorry. Um, the plan third is a planning heuristic, uh, which mean uh, which guides the planning algorithm in searching for a good plan. Cool. So, uh, and to really go into detail, um, tell, you know, if this is too much detail, like feel free, you know, it's not necessarily um, that important to fully understand the exact details, but 
I'll try to, you know, give the qualitative highlights, you know, so we, we model this planning or search budget as uh, drawn from a negative binomial distribution. And this encodes the assumption that spending a lot of cognitive resources on planning is unlikely, but so is spending too little. So this is our prior on how much people tend to think when, when they're planning ahead to solve some problem, if that makes sense. Um, we model the planning algorithm itself using a probabilistic variant of A star search, uh, capturing the intuition that humans often plan by thinking ahead from their current state. Right? And this search algorithm can be seen animated on the left in a grid world domain, where red dots correspond to states the states considered during search. And then combining this with a planning budget gives a pl partial planning algorithm uh, where search goes on until we use up our budget, uh, at which point the algorithm terminates and returns a partial plan to the most recent state considered. And so these partial plans are shown in blue on the left, uh, which the agent executes before starting to plan again. Um, and then as for the heuristic, which guides ASR search, we model this in a domain dependent fashion, right? In domains involving spatial navigation, one might use an optimistic metric like Manhattan distance or a maze distance while ignoring the presence of obstacles, for example. And in other domains, one might use a more general heuristic from the classical planning literature, uh, which estimates the number of steps remaining to the goal by ignoring certain problem constraints. And this choice of heuristic is actually sort of pretty, um, you know, important because it like sort of dictates if you terminate your search for a good plan early, where will your search process tend to be guided? And so if you're overly optimistic about like how you plan ahead and you terminate your search early, you end up forming plans that may end up being overly optimistic and overly optimistic and fail. Um, so, so that's the sort of relevance of the, the heuristic here. Uh, cool. And then finally, mistaken actions due to execution errors, right? Uh, people may not always execute actions as intended. For example, we might walk a step further than intended past our destination or might drop something that we're holding in our hands. We model this by assuming that agents usually execute each action as planned, but occasionally execute another action at random. Uh, so once again, that's the overall agent model, which accounts for mistaken goals, uh, plans, and actions. I'll note briefly that we also tested lesions models, each of which removes the modeling component associated with each category of mistake. So for example, fixing the goal, right? We don't model mistaken goals. Um, we assume optimal planning instead of partial planning, right? So we don't model mistaken planning um, and noiseless actions um, where we don't model the possibility of action mistakes. Right, so um, it's a pretty complicated model. I know I'll, I'll happy to take questions at this point if people have any questions about you know lack of understand you know or like you know it's complicated i totally understand people want to ask questions about the model itself before i go into inference um it seems like it's nothing i can also go on Cool. Well, feel free to ask questions later, um, um, but hopefully that was a clear explanation given uh, no one has questions now. Um, all right. So um, that's a pretty complicated model, right? Uh, having specified that model, we hypothesize that human observers, you know, having this model of other agents in their head, they perform Bayesian inference over that model, right? And so given a prior over possible goals and observations about the agent and its environment, Observers attempt to compute the posterior over goals condition on observations. Right. Um, and we implement this using a particle filtering algorithm, a sequential and first plan search, which I'll go into in more detail. Right. For, for such a complex model, however, exact inference becomes rapidly intractable. Right. And this is one of like tr the traditional critiques of sort of Bayesian cognitive science, which is like, you want to assume that humans are doing Bayesian inference, but is that actually tractable? Right. So consider the following sort of enumerative approach to Bayesian goal inference, right? Uh, for each goal, we either compute all possible plans uh, from the start to the goal, or compute a complete policy for all possible states, uh, and then compute the likelihood of the observations under each plan or policy, and normalize the likelihoods across all possible goals to compute the posterior. Um, right, so, I mean, I, I was gonna ask what's the problem with this approach, but I think I've already explained it, right? Um, right, so, so what for one problem is that our, uh, for our agent model, there may be a tremendous number of possible plans, including highly suboptimal ones to enumerate over. So that quickly rules out that approach if you want to fully enumerate over all possibilities. Um, but while we took a policy based approach, such that we only compute one policy per goal, rather than um, any possible plans. Um, 
Well, once we go to non-trivial domains, this also gets intractable, right? So consider a domain like blocks world with just eight letter blocks, right? How many, how many possible states are there? And, and for people who are not familiar with blocks world, it's just, you know, letter blocks, you can stack them on top of each other. Um, you don't really consider it or X, Y, Z locations. You just sort of can, you know, it's just whether they're down a table, whether they're picked up, and whether they're on top of each other, right? So how many possible states are there? Um, it turns out with um, eight blocks, you can usually form at least eight different English words, right? Uh, sorry, 20 possible English words, uh, at least 40,000 possible letter sequences, and about 400,000 possible states in general. And so if we compute a complete policy via something like standard methods for solving Markov decision processes like value iteration, this will require enumerating over at least 400 possible thousand states, 400,000 possible states, uh, potentially multiple times. And all that computation would have to be done upfront prior to making any observations. Um, and this clearly seems wasteful since the observed agent will most likely never reach those states. Cool. So how can we break this curse of dimensionality? Well, one simple thing you can do is to sample plans rather than enumerate over them, which is a standard approach in Bayesian inference to focus computational effort on latent variables, only on latent variables of significant probability. Uh, but it's not quite enough because there are many possible complete plans. Right. Um, to, be, to do better than that, our, our, our key insight is that if we can assume that agents are boundedly rational, then during inference, we only need to plan ahead as much as the agent does, and thereby spreading the cost of planning over time. Right. This is inspired by, you know, thinking about how humans might infer the goals of others. I don't try to imagine every possible goal someone else might have and then come up with a complete plan for each of them and then check whether it matches what they actually do in order to figure out like what they're, you know, what they're probably doing. Uh, instead, it seems like based on what I see them do, they come up with partial plans that match what they've done so far. And this motivates our sort of uh, Bayesian inference algorithm, uh, sequential inverse plan search, right? which is a particle filtering based algorithm or sequential Monte Carlo based algorithm. And the basic idea is that at every time step, we maintain a set of partial plans for each goal, weighted by their likelihood of explaining the data, the observations. And as new data arrives, we extend only the partial plans that need to be extended, thereby limiting computation. Partial plans that don't explain new data well get pruned away by resampling, so we don't waste computation on hypotheses that no longer make sense. And finally, to get the goal probabilities, we just sum and normalize the weights for all plans each goal, right? So, so to explain this sort of uh, graphic sort of diagram more detail, so imagine at time step two, you know, you're, you're, you don't know yet whether the agent you're watching, the person you're watching is pursuing goal one or goal two. So you come up with like at least two possible plans for how they might pursue, partial plans for how they might reach each of those goals, right? And for goal one, you have this plan, they're going to go right and up, or, or maybe they're going to go right and up and up, right? And similarly for goal two. And time set three comes along, you receive a new observation. Oh, and then your hypothesized plan, one of your hypothesis plans wasn't long enough to be extended to time set three yet, right? So what you do is you like sort of plan on behalf of what the agent might do uh, according to that possibility. But if you already had a plan that's three time steps long that extends the time set three, you don't need to do any more additional planning uh, to extend the hypothesis to explain new data, right? So hopefully that sort of gives a, under you know, more concrete picture of like how it is that this uh, goal inference or goal and plan inference algorithm can happen online. Um, and so here's an example of the algorithm at work in a grid role domain where the agent's trying to pick up one of three color gems. Um, on the right, uh, we show the inferred postures over the possible goals updated over time. Um, and the faint thoughts, okay, I think it's, is this playing? I believe it's not. Um, Oh, I think I think the way I wanted to do this was to make it a little game, but we can do it later, right? Um, um, here's the actual animation. Um, so the faint dots correspond to predicted future steps for hypothesized plans, colored by their corresponding goals, uh, and you can actually see a bit of the online planning going on uh, because initially some of the inferred plans, some of the hypothesized plans, do not extend far enough to reach the blue gem. Uh, and it's only towards the end that algorithm predicts the last few steps of the agent uh, going towards the blue gem. Right. Um, so hopefully, sort of that makes sense of like some of like you know gives a visual depiction of what the inference algorithm looks like. And again, here I will pause for questions because that was maybe a bit of a complicated inference algorithm, and I don't know how much sort of my particular knowledge about Bayesian inference makes it seem more natural to understand otherwise. Uh, 
Um, so any questions? Yeah, I've got a question. Um, in the sequential inverse plan search, how is the the set of hypothesized partial plans come up with? Like, is that specified beforehand? Is that part of the model to sort of generate those? Right. So exactly, it's part of the model. The model when you're running, you're simulating the model. The model has a partial planning algorithm as part of that's part of the model, right? So I'm simulating. You know, every time I sort of sample from the model, I'm going to sample a possible goal. And I'm going to sample a possible plan or partial plan that achieves that goal by running a source search for it for a couple of time steps. Uh, I see. For, okay. for a fix, you know, I'm actually more specifically, I'm going to sample a possible goal, sample a search budget to do extend the partial, do additional planning, and then sample a partial plan up to that search budget. Okay, cool. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, any other questions? I mean, hopefully this gives a sense. I think I'm not sure in what context or how people tend to be taught sort of Bayesian modeling and inference, but it's usually pretty helpful way to think of Bayesian models, Bayesian generative models as like simulators of the world, right? Um, and, you know, sampling from them is equivalent to simulating that model for in time, you know, for some amount of time. Any other questions? Amazing. Uh, let's go on then. Um, all right. So very cool algorithms. Not sure if they work. So let's test them. Um, speed and so in, in, in this New York 2020 paper, you know, we, we did some speed and accuracy experiments, you know, to ask, you know, discussions are approached faster and more accurate than baselines. And it seems that that was case comparable to baselines better in suboptimal demonstrations because we accounted for possible mistakes. Um, and um, speed was like 15 to 180 times faster than sort of these Bayesian inverse reinforcement learning approaches, which do the upfront sort of policy computation, right, that I previously described as like tending to be really intractable. Um, but I think what's more interesting for uh, to actually focus on is like the sort of experiments we subsequently did in this COGSI 2021 paper, uh, where we try to answer uh, the question, does our approach produce goal inferences similar to humans when they watch these stimuli, right? And so to, to do this experiment, uh, we elicited goal inferences from participants as they watch a variety of optimal and suboptimal agent trajectories unfold, right? And these trajectories were designed to make some mistakes uh, appear more likely than others. Um, and, you know, given the complexity of our model, actually, these trajectories might admit multiple interpretations. Was that a mistaken action or a mistaken plan, right? So that's why we actually went some way to design interesting trajectories that might reflect one, at least intuitively, reflect one kind of mistake more than the other. Right? And we did this in two domains. Uh, the first is this grid world puzzle uh, called Doris Keys and Gems, uh, where you know, you're this agent, you're trying to potentially pick up, you know, well, we restricted it to like picking up one of these colored gems. And in order to do that, you have to pick up keys to unlock doors. Right? Um, and you can't, you know, you can pick up multiple keys at once. Just get that's why it's just inventory here, um, but you don't automatically pick things up. And, you, know, you have to like actively turn, pick up the key if you walk over it. And then there's this blocks world domain where um, you might try and spell words with letter blocks, right? And we chose these domains because they exhibit um, some of the compositional structure that humans encounter in daily life, making them tractable to plan in, but also complex enough for interesting mistakes to arise. Um, and now I'll show a couple of illustrative results from running those experiments. So this is the part where I wanted to run this kind of fun game, right? Uh, so watch this agent and try to guess which colored gem is trying to pick up. Oh, okay, I need to restart. I think I actually need to stop the screen share briefly and do this again, because otherwise the animations are going to not work out. So give me a sec. I've learned that Google Slides doesn't really like GIFs for some reason, um, or like it, it plays badly of GIFs, or like started playing badly of GIFs at some point when it, after after doing this presentations for a while. So hopefully, if I do this again, it will do the thing I want it to. Um, I do not need to share sound this time. I think. Okay, can people see that? All right. Um, and I'm going to attempt to jump 
two. Right. Okay, so illustrative results, right? So watch this agent and try to guess which color gem is trying to pick up. Right. Notice that the agent, um, yeah, seems to exhibit a suboptimal plan. Uh, backtracking to pick up the key in order to reach the red gem. Uh, our model accounts for such planning mistakes because we assume that agents might not always plan fully ahead, right? And so the inferences produced by this model, you know, over this model, closely match human average human judgments uh, in contrast to the Boltzmann agent model, uh, which only accounts for action mistakes, right? So you need to account for like planning mistakes, not planning far ahead enough to, in order to account for this kind of, you know, make this kind of inference. Right, once the backtracking happens. Um, and if we do, we, we, we did this over, you know, across all similar backtracking trajectories, uh, we find that our full model, we don't want to consider goal mistakes here, by the way, in this domain, uh, we find that our full model uh, correlates highly with human judgments, right? So again, on the x-axis is the posterior inferences produced uh, by uh, our Bayesian inference over our model, and the um, y-axis are human judgments average across the population. So this is the claim we're trying to make here. I think the most, most, you know, the sort of most minimal claim that you could make from this is that there's correlation between the model posteriors and what averaging over humans would produce. Like to make the additional claim, I think that sort of humans are Bayesian, like requires a couple of assumptions. Like you can sort of like assume that averaging over a population of humans is similar to averaging over like one person doing the same task multiple times. And when one person's doing the same task multiple times, they do something like sampling and produce like slightly different uh, responses each time. Of course, you know, there are things like inter, inter subject variability that might sort of cause into doubt, but I just wanted to clarify, I think uh, this is part of the, you know, uh, part of the sort of methodological assumptions going into like interpreting this, these results, right? But it seems that, you know, if, if you take that, you know, uh, you know, it seems that um, if you take that on board, it seems like the full model correlates a lot better than these lesion models, which don't account for planning mistakes, right? Um, cool. So let's now, now consider a different kind of mistake. Um, so take a second to figure out uh, what the agent would have to do to reach each gem in this environment, right? Um, so I think yellow is trivial, blue is a little harder to reach, and red takes some thought, right? So ha do people, have people figured out like what you need to do to like reach you know, each of the possible gems in this environment? Let's give it a thumbs up if yes, or I don't know. Cool, all right. So um, now watch what happens. Okay, which, which gem was the agent trying to pick up? What would you say? And it could see everything, by the way. The agent, the assumption here is the agent can see everything. It's not that you're like being obscured by walls or anything, but yeah. Um, what would you say if you saw something like this happen? I feel like we have a quiet audience here today. Okay, I'll just say what I would infer. It's like, it, it was trying to reach the red gem, um, right? And, and I think most people watching this would, would, would also seem to say that, right? Like uh, the, the agent was trying to reach the red gem, but got stuck. Oh, I see in the chat now that people are saying red. Um, got stuck, but uh, didn't realize it needed two keys. Uh, didn't realize it needed two keys, not just one, right? Again, our model accounts for this inference because it allows for the possibility of myopic plans. Uh, unlike the Boltzmann agent model, which actually is all misstep solely to action noise, right? Um, and looking at our correlation plots, we see again that our full model correlates more strongly with average human judgments as compared to models which assume perfect planning. Cool. Um, and then finally, let's see an example of mistaken goals, this time in the blocks world domain, right? So watch as this agent stack, uh, stacks lettered blocks and try to guess what word it's trying to spell. So imagine as someone, you know, using your hand, but we're not animating that. All right, so let's watch that again, just in case you miss what happened. All right. And I think, you know, some of you watching this first time would have been, as you guessed, like, it's probably pear. And there's the typo. <laughs> um, and if, you're, if so, you're like, are other human subjects who are accounted for the possibility that the word might be misspelled, right? An instance of goal of confusion in this context. 
Uh, and our model was able to do the same, right? Assigning pair as the most likely goal once its misspelling was observed. And this is in contrast to the Boltzmann agent model, which doesn't account for this possibility. And so you don't see this increase in the inferred probability of the goal at this sort of time step six over here or seven. Um, cool. And looking at the correlation plots, we see again, our full model is more similar, most similar to humans across all trajectories exhibiting, exhibiting mistaken goals. Um, all other models are much less correlated and exhibit much, much, exhibit much more goal uncertainty uh, relative to humans uh, watching these, these stimuli. Um, and so overall, average human judgments correlated highly with our model uh, and more strongly compared to Leach and, and baseline models. And we think these findings provide considerable support for our hypothesis, um, indicating that it's important to model errors at multiple levels of cognition and action uh, to build an intuitive theory of our boundedly rational minds. Um, of course, many open questions remain. And for, um, you know, for one, what kinds of mistakes do human understand beyond the three explored here? Right? And how can we build machines that share this understanding? Right? Prior research has also modeled mistakes like false beliefs. You know, that's a classic sort of classic theory of mind kind of thing is false beliefs uh, and time inconsistency about when uh, when inferring the goals and preferences preferences of others. Um, well, well, false beliefs for the state of the world is the classic, or false beliefs for the dynamics of the world is something more interesting that has only been more recently explored. Um, so how, how should we model, you know, other cognitive, cognitive limitations bound, how should we model them? Right. For another, uh, given the complexity of these models, how can we rapidly and tractably infer the goals and mistakes of others? So this is a technical engineering question, I guess. And, and in our work so far, we've, we've focused on a relatively small number of goals. Um, but the space of goals that humans pursue is incredibly rich. How are we still able to hypothesize possible goals um, that others might be pursuing? And how can inference algorithms manage this space effectively? And so one idea I'm hoping to explore is how hierarchical structure in goals and plans allows us to eliminate most possibilities when trying to infer the goals of others. So that once we've inferred a particular sub goal, the only possible final goals are those that depend on that sub goal. And I'll add, I'm like a separately exploring right now, actually the summer with a student and working with um, the possibility of using large language models as priors over goals in certain contexts, which, you know, they may have tra been trained upon. So giving them a context of like, this is a kitchen, it has like, you know, tomatoes and cucumbers and whatever, like what might someone make? And getting it to su suggest these goals and like convert them to the formal representation we use for the planner here. All right, so I think that's also interesting, potential interesting line of work. All right, and another extension is the realm of uh, continuous motion data, right? So how can our sequential inverse plan search algorithm, if we really wanted to make it work in sort of practical settings, uh, work with agents that perform task and motion planning, right? Uh, this is a sort of term that roboticists use for like solving sort of real world robotics problems, right? And this would be necessary for collaborative robots to truly cooperate with humans in physical workspaces. And I'm actually also working on a project trying to do this um, right now. All right, so those are sort of things you know, sort of more technical sort of future directions, but I think also, I think I wanted to bring this back to this sort of set of questions I posed at the start, it's like how does this sort of inform sort of the AI value alignment and you know what what cognitive science can offer to that, right? And so uh, I think you know there are many possible ways we can take this, but I think you know early on when doing this project, I actually ended up encountering this quote by Stuart Russell in an interview with the Future of Life Institute, sort of directly pointing I think to the need for sort of more cognitive scientific cognitive scientific research. Uh, into how exactly humans, you know, you know, how actual exactly human goals and preferences are connected to human behavior, right? So, uh, for example, Lise Dole, I'm pretty sure wanted to win the game of goal, the game of go, but didn't, and you shouldn't infer from that, uh, that he wasn't trying to win, right? Even though he lost, right? And so Russell goes on to say, you know, ask, you know, what are the cognitive limitations of humans and how do they manifest themselves in the kind of imperfect decisions we make, you know? Uh, we are myopic, we suffer from weakness and will. We know that we ought to do something and this is the right thing to do, but we ought to do something else, right? We're emotional, we do things driven by emotional substance systems and we regret and say, I wish we hadn't done that, right? Uh, and, and, and he suggests, as I, as I believe too, that all this is really important for us to understand going forward, um, how to build sort of machines that can accurately interpret human behavior. And I will say not just behavior, part of behavior is like what humans say, you know, like linguistic communication from humans as well. Uh, as evidence for human preferences, uh, values, and goals. Okay. Um, so um, with that, I think I'll want to make sure I acknowledge my many collaborators in the research I presented today. Uh, Jordan Mann and Tom Silver worked with me on the New York 2020 paper, uh, providing invaluable health experiments. Our Alankari 
uh, Gloria Lynn and Joey Le worked with me in a COGSI 2021 paper performing a lot of experimental design and data analysis. I showed in examples earlier. Uh, and finally, I, like, I can't forget my two co-advisors, Josh Tenenbaum and Vikash Sinka, whose respective expertise in cognitive science and probabilistic programming uh, very much shaped the research I do today. Um, and that's it for me. Happy to go into discussion. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Shen. That was really great. Um, I have lots of questions, um, but I have plenty of time to talk to you about them. So I'm going to give time to other people. Uh, I saw Lux's hand first. Oh, no, that was, that was clapping. Oh, that's a clapping yeah. hand. I see. Yeah. I can't distinguish the... Uh, oh, okay. I thought there were lots of questions. No, those were lots of clapping. Good, good. Well, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, sure. I'll shoot. Um, have you, you mentioned different types of uh, mistakes that the agents can make. Uh, is there, has anyone looked into uh, changing up the, the types of mistakes they can have on the beliefs of the set of actions they're able to take? Like maybe in a grid world, grid world uh, you can only go like up, down, left, right, and the agent thinks that it can go diagonally, but it can't, for example. I'm not sure if that would be uh, useful or anything, but uh, that was just something that came to my mind. Yeah, no, I think that's interesting. Um, it's interesting. I think one way that can be modeled, I think you could possibly call that as falling under like mistaken beliefs about the dynamics of the world. Actions are kind of weird because like, you know, especially in these discrete domains, you're sort of like, like, what does it mean is action is not possible? But it's, it's not in real life, it's act not actually like you know, you have this button and you press it and nothing happens or something like that, right? Um, in real life, it's something like I tried to reach, I thought my arm could reach that, you know, bottle over there, but I couldn't reach it in the end. And so there, there is stuff we're thinking about in the task and motion planning domain where people might not solve that constraint satisfaction problem adequately in events, um, or that kind of just falls out of existing task and motion planning algorithms. That's a mistake that can just arise. Um, but yeah, I do think that'd be an interesting sort of extension, like, like having a sort of mistaken sense of what is possible or like, yeah, I, and either way, you might not realize that one thing you, I think that's easier to, I think, set up is that you think the agent can do more things than they actually can. And so you're very confused uh, by why they're not doing what you might think the most efficient rational thing, or you might think they could move diagonally and the fact they can't, right? Uh, in fact, actually, this comes up several times in one reason why I took some time to explain the dynamics of the environment before presenting experiments today, because people frequently assume a bunch of different things. Like for, for example, that the agents can't see through walls or something like that, and that's a possible explanation they'll end up offering. It actually actually shows how rich human intuitive psychology has become of all these explanations for, 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 for behavior. Um, but they also assume that, oh, you'll automatically pick up the key once you step over the key, or they'll, they'll assume like, you can't pick up more than one key at a time. And that's actually why we add, added an inventory thing in the bottom, because to like make it very clear that you can pick up more than one key at a time. Um, otherwise, it actually does lead to different inferences, depending on, you know, otherwise you would have to use up the key first before going back to the other key, if that makes sense. Um, I think the difficulty there is that um, already, you know, extending this sort of approach to like a larger number of goals can get difficult or challenging, I don't want to say impossible, right? Because if you sampling based approaches, you can make them much more tractable. But like, if you have additional uncertainty about the models of the world, then you want to be like very smart and think about like, what possible like, worlds you're considering, I guess, <laughs> uh, in, in the course of doing inference. Yeah, I, I have a question if... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed your talk, Shen. Uh, so I, I'm curious if you thought about, like, uh, I, I, this was missing in future directions, so maybe it's not possible here, uh, but like multi-agent models with like coordination goals mm -hmm. instead of like these individual tasks, is that something you've been thinking about? Yeah, so I have thought about some of this stuff a little bit, but not worked on it per se, but I do think that it's important to be able to extend these kinds of approaches to multi-agent settings in part because you do ultimately if especially if you 
sort of the, the application domain here is sort of collaborative planning or collab collaborative human robot collaboration, et cetera, then that's a fundamentally multi agent decision problem. And you don't want to model the human as being ignorant of the robot being present or vice versa. And so one thing you could do, I think one thing I have been quite sort of excited about as approach is, um, especially in cooperative settings, you might have, some people have, might have seen this imagine to be paper I posted in the PIB Slack maybe a, a week or so ago. And, and the approach they take is that, you know, one way that people coordinate even without communicating with each other is that they sort of imagine themselves to be this joint central planner, which collectively just takes their goals. And then they sort of like, join like over time infer which which plan or which sub goals the, the joint central planner is committed to in order to, to coordinate. And you might imagine that some of these sort of like bounded rationality assumptions could be applied to that style of modeling as well. Right. I think so I think that's sort of one kind of extension that can be made. I mean, I think more broadly, I think, you know, um, even if you don't take the sort of, you know, imagine central planner approach, which you can't always, right? That doesn't work in average little settings. You probably do want, if you're modeling someone else um, who's interacting with the same environment as you, to model what kinds of mistakes they might make. make. Uh, but the additional difficulty is that you might have to model sort of recursively what they think, you think they will think, you know, what, what you think that they think about you and vice versa. Um, and actually one source of boundedness comes from not being able to do that recursion infinitely, right? Uh, at some point, you have the bottom out that's just intractable. Unless you've already solved for the Nash equilibrium, which in general, again, intractable. Um. Yeah, thanks. It's very curious. I'm wondering if, like, if I want to start playing around with the, the code, will I be able to do that? Is that available? Sorry, if you start, you start with the, sorry? I was asking if the code is available for me to play around with. Oh, the code. Yeah, yeah. Sir, sure. let me send that in the chat, actually, right now. Um, some and of it how is, hard do you think it would be to start setting up like multi-agent models? Would that require quite a bit of? We um, can get in a call separately and talk about that if that's what you're interested in. Yeah. Um, I think there's some additional work needs to be done to get some of the infrastructure working on. Um, yeah, sure. We'll talk to you later about that. Yeah, we are pursuing some work on like using some of the planning infrastructure for multi-agent planning, uh, but we haven't talked about Bayesian inference over the multi-agent planning system yet. If that makes sense. Uh, so that's the code base I just linked. Uh, cool. Um, I think that's TJ. Yeah. Yeah. I I think like I had a question about the multi agent uh, branch of this conversation, which is, mm -hmm. it seems to me that like when people are taking this uh, imagined central planner approach kind of a thing like i think in economics this is basically called like that people often have different consumer preferences and citizen preferences like people often track those two things separately or like quasi separately or something i'm i'm curious to check so i'm not familiar with the concept of citizen preferences um or like what you're referring to by that term right so it's something like that like when when people think about like how the commons should be maintained or like like how the overall governance should happen, they, they often take a perspective that is something like maybe like a joint cognition of like a central planner or something like behind the veil of ignorance, something shaped like that. Whereas when they're deciding over their personal life that like they they are thinking about the scope of preference shaped right. differently. And I'm 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 curious if you have thoughts on the nature of how both these things are bounded rational or like the cognition is bounded bounded like is differently shaped or or like it faces different limitations or something yeah um it's a good question I'm trying to think if I believe there's like some something fundamentally different and there there might be or like something like notably different, I guess, because I think, you know, I think something that is general, which is that like people, institutions, whoever you, you just have bounded computational resources, right, or cognitive resources. Um, and I think one gen very general sort of framework that I came to for like in, in, in work on this project is that one way to model you know, resource rational or boundary rational agents, boundary rational agents is take an existing 
So algorithm for solving a problem and sort of like put some compute bound on it, right? Or put a prior over the computational resources devoted to it. And you can use this as a model, not, not only resource bounded planning, but resource bounded reasoning, which is very similar, you know, like logical reasoning takes a very similar sort of search like process, at least the ways that people have implemented it in, in machines to these kinds of e searchers, search algorithms. Um, there are other algorithms like iterative belief in friends like MCMC, Sigmar Monte Carlo, they're both sort of iterative algorithms. So you can imagine like putting bounds on that, any kind of Monte Carlo style algorithm, putting bounds in number of samples, you know, and that can be a really rich, I think, source of like imagining how people, you know, sort of like tend to try and do things that are like approximately rational, but not fully sort of ideally rational. Um, and I'm trying to think of what part of that I think sort of is maybe specific to the multi-agent context. And I think, I mean, one problem is that, you know, I think part of what makes some of these like um, cooperation-based coordination approaches work is that there's this like common ground assumption, I think, right? It's, I think at least in some restrictive formulations, you need to have some, some kind of common prior. I, I can't remember the exact formulation over like what the world is like, right? Or you need at least, you know, there must be some overlap between the initial beliefs, distributions of different people. Um, and I wonder whether one difficulty there, like in, in achieving coordination, is just like, just having mistaken beliefs about what other people believe or mistaken, you know, and that makes it a lot harder, you know, to, to, to you know, that's that's when I think boundary, boundary rationality plays a role. But I see there's something in the chat as well that maybe that's maybe more directly relevant. Um, Right, I think that's another sort of interesting example that can sort of forgetting what you're fighting for. I mean, it certainly happens at an individual level, but I think clearly at a collective level, something like that seems to be happening in some contexts as well. I shouldn't say clearly, but at least from my point of view. I hope that sort of answers the question. I, I, th I don't know whether it's sort of satisfying. Are there any other questions? I can, um, I guess I have more, I guess, things to say because sort of the question that I wanted to ask uh, was related to multi-agent modeling. Um, but if anyone has a question, please raise your hand and go first. I'd be curious if people have thoughts on the like, this like, what can Bayesian cognitive science offer to AI alignment? But I don't know whether people are like, maybe it's not as interesting of a question that um, I think I think one thing I hope to highlight, and I don't know whether people took this away, is like the practice of like cognitive scientific experimental design is like a helpful way for testing the limits of your systems, right? Like like both for like probing like what humans do, right? But also testing whether your machine systems can do it, right? Like it's not, you know, I think oftentimes when you're doing like scientific research, um, both in like in the general sciences, but also in particular about the human psychology you really like try and design things to like specifically test like some capability to hypothesize that you know might or might not exist and and so like average case performance you know uh which i i think of a lot of machine learning benchmarks as trying to like sort of measure is often not reflective of of that right like you need like i think some of these very specific handcrafted stimuli to or in order to demonstrate a difference uh between you know like what humans seem to be doing and what existing models seem to be doing. Um, I think that was part of their pro this process, right? We, each of these similar, we handcrafted sort of this, this is something like a mistaken plan, this is something like a mistaken goal. And in some cases, we realized that the difference wasn't large enough to elicit kind of like the kinds of inferences we were expecting to see. Um, and so that's one of the points I wanted to, I guess, bring up as well. So I'm sort of curious about uh, like one thing that I'm imagining here is um, and this is going to be no surprise that I'm going to say this word for you and Lux. Um, I'm wondering, you know, if like you're in a sort of cooperative setting where you're like you're on a team and you're the team has to form the team has to sort of act like an agent. So there's a sense in which there's a group agent that's forming a plan. And this seems like it could be really useful. Um, for 
for modeling such a scenario because one of the things that individual agents are going to have to do is um, they're going to have to like form a model of what their team members are planning and they're going to have to adjust to the fact that the the group's plan is sort of determined by like not just them like right like I don't get to just make the group plan be what I want it to be um and so like I have my sort of contribution to what I want the group plan to be but then I'm going to have to adapt in real time as I sort of update on what the group's plan is but and oftentimes like if you're in a team setting it's not like directly obvious to you what the team's plan is right so you so you, you have to like simultaneously be inferring what other team members what their plans are and how they're contributing to the group plan and what the group's plan is at any given moment. Um, so that seems like a, a, a really fruitful application of this. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, no, I mean, this is reminding me actually of, and this really is actually some discussion, like sort of like philosophy of mind or, you know, uh, and, and what kinds of mental states do we need to posit exist, right? Um, and um, which is that, I, I sort of taken for granted in this sort of presentation of the model that humans form plans, right? Which you can formalize at least, you know, partly as these like like ordered sequences of actions, or perhaps partially ordered in some contexts, right? Um, and I will I will note that this is quite different from how a lot of the sort of Bayesian inverse reinforcement learning literature, and at least in recent times, has tried to model these systems which that. They say inverse planning, but really what the object that gets computed is a policy, right? Which is not a sequence of actions, but is a sort of mapping from states of the world to actions, right? Uh, what is the difference between these two things? Um, well, I think it's sort of one thing you might think that sort of, you know, um, I forget this person's Michael Bretman, right? Has this whole paper on like intentions, right? And he his account uh, sort of you can think of as a computational account of what intention is, is sort of partial plans like that, you know, towards some, you know, that achieve some desire. And he wants to have a role for intentions separate from belief and desire, right? Whereas some people just want to say, you know, you can reduce plans to beliefs and desires. Uh, and, I, and I sort of side of, I think, you know, partial, very partial to, to Ratman here and saying that plans are important um, because, and among other things, you it's easier to form them than policies. So like pre-committing to a sequence set of our actions um, can you know, just like computationally more tractable, right? As opposed to computing this full policy over what you would do in every possible contingency, right? But also um, they help with coordination. Like anything, uh, this is not what Bretman suggests, uh, but uh, there is some recent work suggesting like why might people, you know, people seem to be like, their goals and plans seem to be sticky. They, they like, once they form a plan, even though some additional sort of new opportunity arises, they tend to stick to it. And I think part of this, you might sort of just explain away as like, well, people are like not as rational as they could be. But I think, you know, it might be that this is actually something that was evolutionary advantages in group context. Um, and, and at least there's like, you know, some suggestion that, you know, I, I think people, you know, people have like tried to do, I, I recently read a paper that tries to make this argument. Uh, and try to do some experiments that I can't remember what exactly the experiments are now. Uh, but the suggestion is that, you know, if you have, because there can be multiple possible plans, group level plans that might achieve a goal, the more you can commit to a particular strategy, the more others can infer that others, they, they should play the strategy as well. And sorry, that was a bit of a long wind <laughs> kind of circuit is about to like this question of multi-agent planning, but like, um, yes, I think this is like one reason why, you know, this model of you know, agents that commit to sort of partial plans is um, can be sort of useful for coordination purposes, in contrast to some of other approaches, which, you know, assume like policy based planning. Um, no, that was actually that was actually really good. And that was a really helpful tangent for me, because I don't think that I saw the uh, the sort of philosophy of mind significance um, that you know, emphasizing a decision, a decision procedure based on planning rather than a policy. Um, I didn't quite see that. Um, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. I see, I see your point there. I think, I think I agree with it. I'll have to think more about that. Yeah. Um, and it's relevant for more psychology and like the kinds of moral judgments seem to make people seem to make in practice as well. Uh, you know, I mean, this is like the classic example is like, you know, the sort of trolley, trolley problems. Um, and people do seem to make a distinction between like intentionally doing 
you know, doing like killing the like the, the, the sort of double effect. I, I can't remember it exactly the, the exact sort of principle here, but the difference is between like, like, is it necessary to like a, par a part of the plan that this person like, you know, for, to stop the train that you push this person down or is it, was it a side effect, right? Uh, and people have like, I think it's hard to account for that kind of thing without having the notion of a intention or a plan. Um, And there is some computational work on this if people are interested. I, I can I can try and find a paper link uh, to it. I would be interested. Um, I do have one more clarificatory question. If no one else has any, um, so I um, I think I'm I think I missed the point. I was taking notes, and I and I think you said something that excited me, and I was like writing something, and I missed the move from uh, the sort of algorithm that's generating the planning algorithm um, to how you implemented the model in um, inferring other plan um, others plans. So I was just like, how is that algorithmically implemented? Yeah. So. Um... Maybe let's see so how run a model of like how it would plan in the situation. Exactly. You run a model, you simulate how it would plan in that situation. That's how Bayesian, you know, you have a Bayesian model as a simulator and you sort of, you sample a bunch of times from the simulator because it's a random simulator. So every time you sample, it might come up with different goals and every like, different plans. And then, you know, and you condition, but you, you fix such a simulation produces observations you actually see, right? And then you see how likely would it have been that it produces those observations. Um, yeah, I see. Yeah. And and we what we did was we found a, a, a sort of way to like rather than running a full simulation of what the agent might do in advance, we can run that simulation sort of partially on the fly. Yeah. Right, right. Which seems to be, you know, intuitively what humans are doing when we if we are modeling other people by simulating what they might do, it seems like it can't be that we're simulating them all everything that we do in advance. Right, right. That yeah, that might become especially like once you sort of scale up the complexity of the scenario, um, where you have to sort of put yourself into the the you know the preferences of the person whose plan you're trying to model, right? And right. And, have, and and sort of model their utility function or something like that. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, I think I think one thing that's sort of interesting about this as well. And this is reminding me is that. You know, we kind of assumed here that people have like this fixed prior over like how much computational resources people others devote to planning. But you could imagine that being something you infer as well, like, you know, on average, how much in and that's a way of like modeling sort of either expertise or effort when it comes to planning. Well, expertise might be modeled by something else, but at the very least effort when it comes to planning. Um, and it might make for the difference between like someone who tends to plan ahead you know, a lot versus someone who like you know, maybe a child who doesn't really know how to solve these problems yet, right? Because they aren't really able to think very far ahead. And it seems like there's some actually infant psychological studies that suggest that kids who are very young don't really understand uh, other agents forming, having two step plans, right? They don't, they can understand like one step plans, but they don't really understand two step plans. And it's only when they're older that they can. Uh, and one part, I think this is what it lends itself to the simulation theory of mind, I guess, kind of hypothesis about how theory of mind functions, which is that once kids do have the ability to form two sets plans, then they can understand <laughs> uh, how is it that others can, can form two sets plans as well. Right. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Are, are there um, any other questions? I think if not, we will go ahead and end the recording and then people can hang around if they want to have a more informal conversation, if you're up for that, Shin. Yeah, very happy to. I will also order food for myself after the recording ends, but yeah. Good. All right. Waiting bye for 